This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Larry, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you guys for, for showing up to hear me give my capstone seminar. So as Larry said, I, um, I have been working on uh, mapping resistance to willow leaf rust in shrub willow. I've been uh, very active uh, during my time here. There have been, um, I was fortunate enough to have a pretty varied project, so it kept things very interesting. And I, I hope that you uh, think the same um, as I talk about what I've, um, my last couple of years here at Cornell. So the title of my presentation, Multiple Approaches to Mapping Resistance to Melamps Relief Rust in Shrub Willow. So I have a few background slides before I really get into it. So shrub willow is from the genus uh, Salix, the roughly 300 species um, with uh, ploidy levels ranging from diploid to dodecaploid. It can be grown for biomass. It also has phytoremediation properties. It can be used in riparian buffers, or it can be used simply as a physical barrier, like a, a snow block for roadways, or you can even, um, just Google shrub willow fence and you'll find some really, really interesting ways that people have woven shrub willow together to create privacy fences and other like um, gazebo structures. Uh, it is dioecious, so there are male and female plants and highly heterozygous. Uh, and commercially it's produced in what's called a short rotation coppice system. So what that means is dormant cuttings, they're like eight to 10 inches long are planted in the spring. They're allowed to grow until the winter when they go dormant again, and then they are cut back or coppiced. And this will cause the willow to respond the next year with very vigorous, heavily branched growth uh, that's harvested every two to three years afterwards. So you can imagine in these really dense plantings that are in the field for many, many years, uh, insects and pathogens can really get into that field, spread throughout it, take hold, and cause uh, damage. One of the worst of which, um, shocker, I know, is willow leaf rust, or melampsera. Uh, it can lead to complete defoliation of the plant, which obviously will have a downstream effect on the total yield. It is a macrocyclic and heteroecious rust. So in terms of the rust family, that means it will go through all five spore stages common to rust. This includes a sexual phase and it requires two hosts to complete its full life cycle. So if we take a pathogen that has a potential to overwhelm resistance basically every year and we have a plant that could spend 20 plus years in the field, you can start to imagine how that can be a real challenge to shrub willow breeders and producers to trying to find um, durable, long-lasting resistance. So in New York, there are primarily two main species of Melampsera, Melampsera americana and Melampsera paradoxa, but there are um, others who are less prominent. Uh, as I kind of alluded to, the management strategies rely on pyramiding resistance, so trying to get as many resistance genes into a single plant as possible, and even planting clonal mixtures. So instead of having a willow field full of just one um, willow clone, um, they will plant several different clones in the hope of trying to put less pressure on diseases or insects to adapt to that resistance, to break that resi those resistance genes. Unfortunately, most of the literature, well, it's not unfortunate for them, it's unfortunate for us. Uh, most of the literature focuses on European species of Melampsera and Salix. So while we have, there's a lot to learn from the work that's being done in Europe, but when it comes to things like Melampsera Americana or Salix purpurea, um, things are only generally applicable and not very specific. And those resistances that they might have identified in those European species of willow don't necessarily connect to what we have here. So with that in mind, um, the research objectives of my uh, pre-doc fellowship, um, in addition to the original USDA grant that I was on when I first got here, uh, these 
um, research objectives. The first, there are three of them, excuse me. And the first was to leverage the common parent F1 hybrid population to map QTL for resistance to the leaf rust. So obviously I need to tell you what the common parent F1 hybrid population is. <laughs> so to simply describe it, you can think of it as there are eight F1 hybrid families and there are essentially divided into two half sib families. So there are four, um, four female species all mated to the male Salix purpurea 9401. So that's a Salix viminalis, Integra, Salix alberti, and Cetruensis. While at the same time, there are four um, males of different species mated to the female 9406, Salix purpurea. So nine, uh, excuse me, Salix purpurea was chosen as the kind of the backbone of this population. One, because it is a naturalized species to North America. So that means, although it was not native, um, it was brought here um, from Europe as a basket willow and it eventually gained such prevalence that it could be found in the wild. And so it's considered a naturalized species. Um, in addition, uh, Salix purpurea tends to be resistant to several pathogens and many of the insects found around here, in addition to its aesthetic appeal. On a genomic standpoint, it is 9406 is also uh, the most, um, the highest quality reference genome that we have available to us. Uh, Salix viminalis, uh, there are two crosses here. That was chosen because Salix viminalis is the most popular species grown in Europe. And a lot of those, the research that I mentioned earlier that's occurring in Europe uses Salix viminalis and it's a known source of resistance to those European species of Melampsera. The other species that's used twice, Salix cetruensis, that is the most uh, popular species that's grown in China, while the other four species are mainly included to uh, add diversity to the population and, and to um, catch a, a, cast a wider net into the diversity within Salix than we could do with just three species. So you can see the population sizes for each of these families. They range from 88, uh, the smallest one, to 150. They're all planted in replicated trials here in Geneva uh, in fields that are right next to each other. They were planted at different years, um, but they are in replicated trials um, in Geneva. So within the common parent population, we have several research questions. So it was originally designed for, and the justification for making these crosses was to map uh, to identify QTL for leaf rust resistance. But with this kind of resource, we can really do several things with it. So I'm gonna talk about those two sort of tangent research questions that I have, and then I'll come back to, to leaf rust resistance in a, in a second. So I mentioned that one of the crosses to 9401, Salix purpurea 9401, was a Salix alberti. And this was the species identification that we received uh, that Larry received, it was before I got here, but when what Larry received when it came from China. And he, we've never really seen Salix already mentioned anywhere else. And so we're not really sure where it fit in. So is it its, its own unique species that's just not referenced anywhere, that's not used very often? Or did someone just sort of name it and it's actually related to one of the other species that we have in our population? So we wanted to figure out where Salix already fit in with the other parents. So to, to do that, I took all of the GBS data that we had for all of the populations and I filtered for very high quality markers. I filtered um, down to about uh, 50,000 SNPs um, to do the, these next few analyses. So I um, generated these two separate PCAs. So the one on the left side of the slide includes all the parents with the F1 progeny, while the PC on the other side includes just the parents. So what we can see on the one with the F1s, uh, our red, the red dots, these are the two Salix viminalis families with their F1s. Uh, the blue is the Salix udensis. We have our two common parents in the middle, while the other, uh, this is the Salix uh, coreanagi down here in the gray, 
while our two Salix, Setuensis, Integra, and the Alberti are all sort of clustered together here. What this PCA is really doing and what, really, what we can really learn from this is on principal component one, it's really separating these families into their sections. So Viminalis and Udensis are known members of section Vemin, while Setuensis, Integra, and Koryanagi are known members of section Helix. So this at least tells us from that standpoint that P294 is going to be in section Helix along with the Salix, Setuensis, and the Integras. When we look at a PCA of just the parents, we see PC1 is still splitting along the same lines, but it does bring our two Salix purpurea parents together and really groups the parents into more into tighter clusters uh, that we can see here. So taking all the multiple runs of the parents that I had, I generated a neighbor joining tree, um, which really shows, um, which obviously is grouping the multiple runs of the parents together, but we have our Udensis parent here with the Viminalis, our two Salix purpurea, the Corianagi and Integra, and it's putting P294 very close to P295 and P63. So this would, from this alone, we can kind of see that it's probably closer to a Salix Setuensis, but when we take all of these multiple runs of the parents, um, oh, excuse me, so I used the multiple runs of the parents and randomly selected 10 individuals from each of the, uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> I randomly selected 10 individuals from each of the F1 families and ran a fast structure analysis. So fast structure is literally, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of structure. So fast structure um, fulfills the same basic goal, but it's designed to use large GBS uh, SNP data sets. So you run uh, the main function of fast structure with varying levels of K, K being the number of populations. So I ran um, from three to 10 uh, estimated populations, and then you run a function called choose K, and choose K will go through all of the output files that you generated and tell you which level of K, which number of populations best fit your data set, your input files. So in the case of these families, that level of K equals six. So for each of the F1s, um, I use purple to designate Salix purpurea. So this makes total sense that each of the F1s are roughly 50% Salix purpurea. Well, the other half are their other parent. What's worth noting here is that when we look at P294, it's actually showing up as the same population as Salix Setuensis. So we, we're leaning towards section Helix and then maybe it's a Setuensis hybrid, but from the results that we can see here, uh, we're pretty comfortable saying that Salix Alberti is actually just a, another Salix Setuensis and possibly even a full sieve of P295. I'm not really sure where the Salix Alberti came from, um, but it's good to know where this parent fits in regards to the other parents. So like I said, Salix Alberti P294, we're really considering it a, a Salix Setuensis P294. So for the next two research questions that um, I had for this populations, I needed to create linkage maps for all of the parents. So I'm going to kind of go on a quick tangent, talk about how I um, made these linkage maps, and then we'll loop back around to these research questions. So to start out with, they used the TASL GBS version two discovery pipeline to call variants. They were aligned to the Salix Purpurea 9406 version 5.1 reference genome. This yielded between 170 to 250,000 sites, depending on the family. Then I use TASL to filter markers for and individuals for missing this minor allele frequency, but excuse me, minor allele frequency. This cut the number of markers down to 125,000 and to 200,000. Then I used a program called Link Imputer. And yes, it is Link Imputer. 
um, I don't know how long I kept saying link impute R, but it, yeah, it's link imputer. Uh, it's a imputation algorithm that was actually designed to handle non-model organisms where um, with greater heterozygosity than uh, some of the other imputation algorithms out there. It was also, um, what's unique about it is that even if a genotype is called missing, you're still passing in the VCF file. So it accesses the read depth on markers that were even called missing. So what I had done with Link Computer is I set any markers that were called with a read depth less plus to five than missing, refiltered for missingness and minor allele frequency, and then imputed those missing values. And so the uh, VCF files that came out of Link Computer had about 90 to 150,000 sites. So taking that VCF file, I then passed it into R to um, pull out the back cross markers that I was going to use to generate these linkage maps. So I really focused on back cross markers. So in the case of a female back cross marker, that means it is um, female informative. So therefore it's heterozygous in the female, AB by AA, or male back cross where it's male informative. And this resulted in 70, so now I'm, dealing with two separate groups of markers based on um, the marker type. So this generated, um, for the female maps, there were 7,500 to 24,000 female backcross markers, or the male maps, there were 8,700 to 20,100 male markers. So to actually uh, construct the linkage groups and assess the marker order, excuse me, I used a combination of RQTL and AS map. So RQTL is pretty standard in QTL mapping, but AS map is essentially a R wrapper for the MST map algorithm. So I really only filtered for um, extreme segregation distortion and co-location while generating, while determining those linkage groups in the marker order. So the final maps had between 21,000, 3,500 female uh, the female back cross maps, excuse me, have between 21 and 3,500, while the male maps have between 2,000 and 3,900. So I did that for all of the eight families, resulting in 16 separate linkage maps, one for each parent um, in each population. So now I can go back around to our research questions now that I have that done and say that um, one thing the last tangent I wanted to cover with the common parent population is to talk about the Salix Integra P336 individual. So every cross in our breeding program that's ever used that parent as an individual has generated F1 that are 100% female. And this is something that Larry and I, and even uh, Brennan, who uh, is working on sex determination have talked about several times. Uh, trying to figure out possibilities for how this is happening. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to look at it from a, a view of potentially if it's an extreme form of sex ratio bias or potentially if there's something structural about P336 where it's only able to generate female um, F1s. So I mentioned sex ratio bias. So while the 426 family uh, this fifth one down from the bottom is 150 to zero, female to male. Um, six out of the eight families in this population have some degree of sex ratio bias, all skewing toward the female. And I have I've spent a lot of time recently reading about sex ratio bias, and everything seems to point to um, segregation distortion outside of the sex determination region as sort of being the culprit. There, um, one paper even referred to it as a, a sex distorter locus um, that resides outside of the traditional SDR. Um, sorry, uh, the traditional SDR in Salix. So the first thing I needed to do was I took all of the, the sex phenotype that I had and I mapped it uh, for QTL to try and figure out where the SCR is in each of these families. 
So naturally, I was only able to find QTL for sex on, in seven of these families, obviously with the 426 family with no variation for sex, you can't map a QTL. So that's why it's only seven out of eight. What is interesting, or I should say what's worth noting, is that in each of, in the seven families, the QTL for sex occurred only in the female parent. So this makes a lot of sense uh, when you think about the sex determination uh, system for let's say Salix purpurea, that's a ZW system where the female is a heterogametic sex and the male is homozygous, um, it's homogametic. Because we're using female backcross markers and that's essentially the definition of a female backcross marker. Like I said, it's female informative, heterozygous in the female. And just to provide an example, this is the peak marker from the 13X438 family with the 9406 individual. That's uh, this plot here, the third down on the right. I coded males as one, females as zero, um, just showing that it's a near perfect marker. These two oddballs are likely genotyping errors or phenotyping errors, um, but it's a nearly perfect marker showing that all of the females are uh, heterozygous at that locus or at that marker, excuse me. So kind of pivoting a bit and going back to P336, uh, these are all chromosome 15. I'm not sure if I said that. Uh, all of these chromosomes are chromosome 15. And what's worth noting is that the Cinemorgan distance for each of these chromosomes ranges from like 200 to 300 Cinemorgans. Yet for the 426 family, there may be only 20 markers and roughly 35 cinnamorgans. So when I saw this, I was a little freaked out uh, because in other iterations of this map, I had trouble getting a stable chromosome 15 to exist at all. Um, so I tried several times to get something from chromosome 15 to stick around in that linkage map. Uh, so I really wanted to know, is this because there are fewer female backcross markers in that population or is it something else? Um, so what I ended up doing is I went back into R, went back through uh, my R script and found the R files where I had typed all of the markers. So I took chromosome 15 and I binned it into half megabase bins um, with each of the different marker types that I, that I found. So what's important before I keep going with these plots is that obviously a marker type is dependent on how the parents aligned together. So in determining a marker type, these are the four, uh, four families that used 9401 as the male parent. So they had a different female parent, but they're all, these marker types are, we can compare them because one, they're all aligned to the same male uh, parent, 941. So the colors on this plot are showing uh, in blue, the male backcross markers, uh, purple, the female backcross markers. The gray are um, markers that are homozygous, but for different alleles. The green are homozygous for the same alleles while the yellow, which there, there is some yellow, but it's, there's not very much, are our intercross markers. So um, in order to kind of narrow down the chromosome and try and figure out where the SCR is, I took the QTL from the previous slide for each family and put in these red bars showing, uh, showing the rough location of the, that QTL like what is encompassed within that QTL for sex. Uh, just to try and narrow down the chromosome. And then I added this dashed line to 426, um, just as like a projected SDR uh, potentially. One thing, the only real conclusion that can be drawn from these is that yes, there are fewer female backcross markers within the projected SDR on 13X426 for that family. But in regards to the other marker types, there are relatively consistent numbers of markers 
So it's difficult to um, take this data set any further to draw any real substantial conclusions about P336. But what I can do, um, the next steps, I mentioned that there is a paper that had identified a, a sex ratio distorter locus. So I intend to use in the next couple of weeks, use the methods described in that paper to see if I can find a, um, a sex ratio distorter locus in these families. One other potential, um, um, <laughs> excuse me, one other potential solve for um, the P336 problem is to align the GBS reads to genome assemblies that are currently in production by Oak Ridge National Labs. So they are actually creating genome assemblies for each of the parents within this population. So that will probably offer the greatest potential to figure out exactly what's going on in P336. So to answer this research question, a definitive answer is beyond the scope of this project. Uh, so we'll have to check back in later. So to move on into, uh, to go back to leaf rust, uh, leaf rust severity was surveyed in these families uh, in two years, 2017 and 2019. These plots are showing uh, the eight families within the common parent population. The families on the left side of each figure are those that are mated to 9406. The families on the right are those mated to 9401. Uh, within each plot, the solid black horizontal bar is showing the severity of that common parent, while each black dot in a column is showing the severity of that species, uh, that family's specific parent, off parent. So you can see depend, um, between 2007 and 2019, there's a pretty drastic change in the severity uh, between the years. Um, obviously it couldn't show it, but in 2018, rust never showed up. So it can be extremely vari um, variable between years. And there's even quite a bit of variation um, within family for leaf rust severity. So using the 2017 leaf rust data, I was able to find three separate QTL in three different families. Uh, so the 421 and the 407 family are the two Salix viminalis, and these QTL were actually found in the viminalis parent. One was on chromosome four, another was on chromosome three. So both of these QTL are okay. <laughs> let's, let's be honest, they're okay. Um, there is some variation, but they are also coming from a, a small amount of um, leaf rust severity, but they are worth looking into. And the last one from 2017 was found in the 13X440 family, the 9401 parent on chromosome eight. This one has a lot of, um, there's still, has a higher level of, a higher range overall of leaf rust severity, but again, they are still pretty clustered together. With the 2019 data, however, um, I was able to find four separate QTL for leaf rust. The first one was on the 426, that uh, 336 parent that I just finished talking about on chromosome five. That one is showing um, greater variation among the heterozygous um, allele for leaf rust severity. So anything homozygous is lower resist, um, lower overall severity to leaf rust. Um, while for the 10X400, 13X440, and the 13X443, all three of these families involve a Salix Sechuensis parent. And all of the QTL reside on chromosome 19. What's interesting is in two different families, but for the same parent, we were able to identify the same QTL. Um, the QTL in very similar regions, uh, despite having uh, different levels of variation where the variation in 443 has a lower overall level of leaf rust severity but is more variable. So these QTL on chromosome 19 offer potential um, uh, all of the QTL that I was able to find for leaf rust severity offer potential um, for further screening 
candidate, uh, trying to identify candidate genes or even use as marker assisted selection down the road. So I hope to, uh, so these are all of the phenotypes that I've collected on these populations and I intend to use to try and map and identify QTL for every trait that I can on the, in these populations. So the final research question, do any of the families have QTL for leaf rust resistance? Yes, yes they do. The second research objective for this population um, was uh, to identify QTL for resistance for Salix propria F2 mapping population. Fortunately, this was taken care of before I got here and was published in Carlson and Gauker et al. 2019. They use an F2 population derived from the naturalized Salix purpurea, surveyed leaf rust in Geneva in 2015 and 2017, and they were even able to detect overlapping QTL on chromosome one um, and additional QTL from a 2015 survey on chromosomes five and 10. The final research objective, which uses that same F2 mapping population um, was to identify temporal gene level responses to infection by Melampsera americana within the F2, the Salix purpurea F2 population. So we knew from the results of that previous study that there was untapped variation that we could further describe and use in an uh, RNA-seq experiment. So that's what this objective is really um, meant to focus on. So what we plan to do is use 60 genotypes uh, with two experimental, experimental replicates in the greenhouse. We plan to inoculate one treatment and use the other as an uninoculated control and sample at three separate time points at zero HPI, which is just before inoculation. And then again at 42 and 66 HPI. So what we actually, what we ended up doing um, after we collected the initial time point using leaf punches, we had these really cool little leaf punchers that had a test tube attached to them. So you could just punch the leaf and the disc would fall straight into a test tube. Uh, and it was frozen um, nearly almost immediately with liquid nitrogen in the greenhouse. But we would collect six to eight leaf punches per leaf. Um, and after the initial collection for zero HPI, uh, both control and inoculated treatment spent 12 hours in a mist chamber uh, where we, um, before which we had brush inoculated the inoculated treatment and flagged those leaves with blue flagging tape, as you can see in this picture here. So using, um, um, excuse me, <laughs> using the 2015 and 2017 leaf rust severity data that they had used to map QTL in the Carlson and, in the Carlson and Gauker paper, um, we selected 28 resistant and 28 susceptible F2 genotypes based on those two surveys. Uh, in, a, in addition to the um, parents and grandparents of that F2 population. Nine days after each greenhouse rep, uh, Chase Crawl went in and rated leaf rust severity um, in each population. So he's also the one who did all of the rating. Well, he and um, Chris Smart did the leaf rust severity rating for the QTL that I mentioned earlier. I should have said that then. Uh, yes, yeah, so they were the ones who did the leaf rust rating in the fields, and Chase is the one who did the rating in the greenhouse in the exact using the same kind of style scale rating that he did in the field. So this is just uh, two plots showing that the leaf rust severity between our two greenhouse reps and those reps in the field all have moderately uh, so have significant but moderate to high. Um, correlations. Um, also needing to mention that uh, the susceptible genotypes had a significantly higher leaf rust severity than the resistance, even though the resistant genotypes were quite more, were more variable in their severity than the susceptible ones. We think this is likely because in the greenhouse experiment, we use one specific isolate where in the field it could have been that isolate and maybe others um, 
that were being raided on while in the greenhouse, it was just one specific isolate. So after we collected the leaf disks from the greenhouse, we extracted RNA and sent the, to the Cornell BRC for three prime RNA seq. Uh, the rims were treed, uh, <laughs> the reeds were trimmed using trimomatic. They're aligned to, again, the 9406 version one, version 5.1 reference genome. Uh, we got our expression count data using HTSeq, normalization and DEseq2. And then those normalized counts were used for differential expression analysis and network analysis, and also EQTL mapping in addition to all the GBS data that they had used from the Carlson and Gauker paper. For the differential expression analysis, I effectively split it into two separate uh, main contrasts. The first contrast was a direct contrast between the susceptible and the resistant genotypes. In order to do this, I split the samples into six time point by treatment groups. Um, that way I could rule out any differentially expressed genes that were present at zero HBI or in the control treatment, it allowed me to have more control over which differentially expressed genes um, were relevant or we could see. So what this allowed me to do was to identify those differentially expressed genes that were either up, upregulated in the resistant genotypes, upregulated in the susceptible genotypes. The second contrast was between treatments, inoculated versus control. So the samples were split into six time point by type groups. So this, um, Again, I ruled out differentially expressed genes, whether or not um, based on whether or not they were present at zero HPI. And then these were sorted into type specific or not type specific uh, differentially expressed genes. And I'll explain that in just one second. So results of the direct contrast between susceptible and resistant, there were very few genes that were um, differentially expressed at 42 HBI. Um, there were only six that were upregulated among the resistant. Just to, to give some examples, there was a polyubiquitin 10, plasma membrane intrinsic protein, and a phosphoglycerate kinase 1, all of which have been implicated in disease resistance. Um, while those that were upregulated among the susceptible uh, several of them were involved in the flavonoid synthesis pathway. When we get to 66 HPI, we had a, there were more differentially expressed genes. Again, most of the ones upregulated among the resistant could be classified as your usual suspects for uh, disease resistance, while those among the upregulated among the susceptible genotypes uh, showed enrichment for response to heat, stress, or reactive oxygen species. So one thing that was obvious to me is that compared to other papers, when there's a direct contrast between susceptible and resistant, we're dealing with smaller log fold changes than what I had seen in some other systems or some other papers. So my initial reasoning for this is that perhaps um, this, this is an F2 population, things are gonna be closely related. And um, based on the QTL paper that um, the, the paper I keep referencing with the, the Carlson and Gauker paper, um, we could tell that they had identified three QTL um, with the expectation in that paper that there were likely others that they weren't able to detect, detect um, summarizing or concluding that it's likely multigenic um, resistance. And so, if we think about smaller log fold changes, smaller effect genes, we're not dealing with anything major effect. It's just a small amount, a large number of small changes in expression that could lead to a difference between a compatible or an incompatible interaction. Looking at the, um, the results between inoculated and control, um, again, I split these differentially expressed genes into resistant specific, susceptible specific, and not type specific. So what I meant when I said that earlier 
is that in a resistance specific difference expressed genes, that means that it was differently expressed in the res only the resistant genotypes and not in the susceptible ones, and vice versa for the susceptible specific. If something is if a, something is called a not type specific differently expressed gene, that means obviously that it was differently expressed in both the resistant and the susceptible genotypes. So what these plots are showing, it's relating the log fold changes between the resistant on the y-axis and the susceptible on the x. <laughs> and grouping them into their type-specific um, log fold change uh, difference. So in the three groups that were enriched, that were in the positive log fold change, resistant-specific, susceptible-specific, and not type-specific, all three of those groups were enriched for defense response. So already at 42 hours post inoculation, we see a common defense response between both the resistant and the susceptible genotypes, but we also see a sp specific defense responses. We already see um, some differences at that level in, ex um, in response to treatment um, between the resistant and the susceptible genotypes. Well, um, and the negative log full change decreasing uh, log full change, uh, those, the resistance specific and the susceptible specific were really only enriched, enriched for chloroplast components. Um, not full photosynthesis just yet, but just chloroplast components. But by the time we get to 66 HPI, um, we have a lot more genes being engaged, our log full changes are increasing, things are really starting to ramp up. But we see that only the resistance specific and not type specific positive log full change groups. Those two are the only two groups that have retained that enrichment for defense response. So our susceptible genotypes and our positive log full changes have lost some of those unique uh, defense response genes. We also see that now, um, and I should have put this on here, but now we can see in the negative log full changes, all three of these groups, that's a lie, I'm sorry. <laughs> the resistance specific and not type specific negative log full changes are the only ones that are enriched for photosynthesis related terms. So it's pretty common to see in the literature that uh, in studies like this, where there is some exchange between uh, promoting a defense response and photosynthetic efficiency in use. You know, a plant has a finite number of resources. And so in a more coordinated response, you would see a drop in photosynthesis that corresponds to an increase in that defense response. So at this stage, we can already see, um, see that playing out. I'm sorry, I just looked at the time. Um, the next uh, analysis that we have is a network analysis. Um, these samples were split into two separate groups, uh, resistant and susceptible inoculated. Um, I, a network analysis, the R package I used for network analysis was a WGCNA. It's a weighted, keen, weighted gene co-expression network analysis. It essentially takes gene expression from your whole entire RNA-seq data set and forms them into co-expression modules that have a common variation uh, through your data set. I used a hypergeometric test to com make comparisons between the two groups, the two separate networks that I developed, and use the plugin Cytohubba inside Escape to calculate connected disk metrics that I used to uh, determine hub genes. So I wanted to figure out which modules were most related to time uh, to try and see if I could find any that were constantly increasing or decreasing depending on the time point. And this helped me narrow down in the resistant network to the turquoise module, which had a 0.92 positive correlation with a uh, time point. It was also the only module on the resistant network that was enriched for defense related terms. The blue module, um, had a negative 0.89 correlation. It's the second largest module. And it again was the only resistant module that it was enriched for photosynthesis related terms. So based on the results of the differential expression analysis, I knew I wanted to focus on 
um, that partitioning of resources that um, kind of exchange between defense response and photosynthesis. So I used a hypergeometric test, which is essentially the same sort of analysis that a GO um, enrichment analysis, a genotology enrichment analysis uses. I used the susceptible network as the background. So each gene was tied to a specific module. And I used the turquoise and blue modules as the input list to be able to basically tie a p-value to each set of modules. So the turquoise module was significantly tied to four separate, it basically split into four, where the um, susceptible turquoise and the susceptible salmon modules are the only two that retained enrichment for those defense related terms. So you see that module shrinking, but also splitting in two. While the resistant blue module split into, effectively shattered into six separate susceptible modules. However, only two of those modules, the S brown and S red, uh, kept enrichment for those photosynthetic related terms. So I, seeing how those full modules were basically split into smaller modules and a susceptible group, it got me thinking about the role of hub genes in each of these networks. So a hub gene is considered the most connected or structurally important genes within that module. And they're predicted to have a regulatory influence over the remaining genes. Um, so what I had done is I had um, basically identified the hub genes for each of these, those four modules that I talked about, where you have the um, resistant turquoise and the, resi and the susceptible turquoise module. In each of these plots, the bars on the outer side are the two, are the hub genes at that time point, um, their average expression related to the shared number of genes. So in the case of the two turquoise modules from the different networks, they share 3,500 genes, um, but they are controlled by different numbers of hub genes that's related to the size of that overall module. So in the in respect to time, and I'm very sorry that I've gone over, I um, will just highlight this one plot here and show that the turquoise modules at T0, they're all equal. The hub genes, the average hub gene, ex average expression of the hub genes is equal to the average expression of the rest of the genes in the module. But as time goes on and those defense response genes are starting to kick in, we see that the resistant, the hub genes of the resistant module are actually expressing significantly greater on average than the hub genes of the susceptible module. So what this told me was that even though we might not have had so many genes that were um, significantly differentially expressed between the resistant and the susceptible genotypes, there is still a, a common response between the two groups, but the resistant genotypes were responding that much faster and just that much more um, on average. So that's 3,500 genes that are expressing just that much more in the resistant genotypes than those exact same genes are in the susceptible uh, group. So briefly on the photosynthesis side, um, the hub genes that are controlling those genes are gradually decreasing through time even though it's having a very small effect on those shared genes, um, we still see that sort of trade-off between the increase and the decrease based on whether it's defense response or photosynthesis. So I only have a few slides left. Again, I'm really sorry that I've gone over. Um, the EQTL mapping, I split the samples into six separate time point by treatment groups ruled out EQTL based on whether they were present at, uh, before inoculation or in the control treatment. And in order to call something a hotspot, I, had, I ran a permutation test on the maximum number of genes that can associate with a single SNP by chance uh, to get a permuted um, threshold. So through these methods at 42 and 66 HPI, I identified eight hotspots at 42 which one um, noted by these letters. 
and six hotspots at 66 HPI. Unfortunately, none of these hotspots were specifically enriched for defense-related terms, but several of the E genes within each hotspot are your usual uh, suspects in terms of defense response. Um, there are also some of those, some of the genomic regions of that hotspot actually are nearby um, some of these defense response genes. So in order to identify candidate genes in this study, I looked at the intersection of genes that were differentially expressed, genes that were that are hub genes for the resistant blue or turquoise modules, and also those genes that are associated with an EQTL hotspot. And so this created a list of 124 candidate genes, and I just pulled out um, a few examples, uh, a CAP superfamily protein wall associated kinase or a UDP um, glucosyl transferase gene, all of which um, these three have the um, most significant correlation with the severity um, of the candidate genes. So the takeaways from this presentation, I was able to identify several QTL associated with leaf rust resistance. So these could be used as potential targets to identify candidate genes or even for future development for marker assisted selection. Uh, numerous, uh, several of these families have uh, produced F1 individuals that are now being used in yield trials and for breeding. Um, and also was able to isolate 124 candidate genes uh, that can be potential targets for QRT PCR validation in the future. So I wanna thank everyone for um, sticking around. Um, thank everyone in the Larry Smart Lab, past or present with a special shout out to Craig Carlson and Eric Fabio who answered a lot of my dumb questions. Um, Holly and Chris from Chris Smart Lab uh, and a special shout out from their lab to Chase, who was really kind of my partner in crime and everything related to leaf rust. And he's, I feel like we've helped each other a lot along the way and I really appreciate him. Um, and I'd also like to thank my graduate committee, which is obviously Larry Smart, uh, Chris Smart, Bruce Reich and Michael Gore. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dustin, great job. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions here, but I'll just mention Chris and I have to leave at 1.30 to go get our vaccination. Uh, so you can either unmute and ask your question directly or type it in the chat, whichever you prefer. So I will just start with a question, Dustin. I'm very intrigued uh, by the resistance genes that map to chromosome 19. Uh, we're kind of desperately trying to identify uh, loci that may be involved in sex dimorphism. And chromosome 19 is the location of the sex determination region in poplar. So I'll ask the question, do we see any sexual dimorphism for rust resistance in salix? And maybe if so, maybe there's an interaction there between the evolution of Daishi and sex dimorphism for rust. Do we see any sex dimorphism for rust resistance? So I have had, I've heard mixed reviews on that, <laughs> depending on who you talk to, if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, in this data set, I don't. Um, in this population, I don't see any relationship between sex and leaf rust resistance. Um, that's really all I can speak to. Yeah. The, just again, the evolutionary ties uh, in the evolution of the Salicaceae are very interesting with the movement of the sex determination region uh, between 15 and many of our Salic species, 19 in poplar and chromosome seven on other Salic species. Uh, so there is a question in the chat from Shatai. Is the QTL on chromosome 19 contributed by the heterozygous parent? 
sorry, I was I, I stopped sharing my slides, so I just went back and looked. It looks like it is uh, contributed by the um, heterozygous parents. So in the 9401 map, the male is the heterozygous. Um, it's a male informative marker, so it would be contributed by the heterozygous parent. So it is coming from 9401. It's mapping back to 9401. Other questions? Well, certainly you see that uh, Dustin still has a little more analysis to do. All those other traits that we mapped in our F1 common parent populations, that's going to yield a lot of interesting results. Uh, his data are feeding right into our NSF funded project on sex determination. So that's great and will help out Brennan a lot. And uh, he's uh, on a solid foundation to start contributing to our hemp uh, breeding program after he graduates this summer. So thanks again very much, Dustin. Thanks everyone for joining us today and have a great day. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.